Okay, the recording is on. Uh, good and Erev fast day, everyone. Great to be able to learn with Erica. And I hope everybody by now has completed her book on Esther and started already on the Haggadah. Um, <laughs> there will be a test at the end of the session. So, uh, please, without further ado, let's hear about Vashti and whether or not you got canceled. <laughs> yeah, oh, good. Uh, oh, that would have been a good title. And thank you for reminding me that there's a fast day tomorrow. Eating is one of the few pleasures we have during COVID. <laughs> All right, so let's talk Vashti. Vashti, um, I, I want to just establish some of the myths that we grew up with about Vashti. What she looked like, what she did wrong. Anyone want to shout out something? I don't know. People always said she was ugly. <laughs> ugly. Yes, she was ugly, even though the text does not say that. No, it doesn't. Anyone that's what remember? you're told when you're little. So you're like, Vashti had pimples. I don't, that's what I remember <laughs> being told. Gosh, she had pimples and she had another fascinating non-human feature. Anyone remember what it was? Jeopardy, Jeopardy for 400. She had a tail, right? Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is where that came from. And the fact is, oh, there, oh, there she is. Does she have a tail? I don't know the tail, but she was green. She turned green, that made her green. She has a tail, right, she turned green. There's all these stories about her. And the question is, how did that happen? But more interestingly, I think, is the fact that there is now a Vashti children's book. It just came out this month called Vashti's Comfy Pants, where the fact that Vashti said no to the king has made her a symbol of female empowerment. So you're going, wait a minute, what happened here? And how did this transition happen? So what I want to do is share the screen with you. I want to look at an image of Vashti that's probably a little bit different than the image we have of her and invite you to comment and of course any comment question debate let's just let's just have it let's have a fun time at lunch all right so Vashti uh, and now yeah go ahead I, I just want to say she looks very Rubenesque so she looks lovely <laughs> she looks lovely in this right she's um she's painted actually differently than the darker skinned um uh, women in this uh, in this uh, depiction um in fact she's very light skinned um not surprising this was done by an english artist so maybe even for england she was dark uh the artist is edwin long his father actually was a hair cutter and he grew up in somerset in um uh, in england and he painted this in 1879 and i think it's a beautiful picture um and then the question is what's going on in this picture things that you're noticing what are you noticing? Yeah, everybody's tending to her. Yeah, they're they're tending to her. They're looking actually very sort of like, uh, uh, you know, petitionary, right? Supplicants here. And the question is, they're asking her something that she is not going to say yes to. They're asking yeah. her to go out to the party. Yeah, but, that's right. But you notice that her body's all lit up and the rest of the scene is darker. Right. Like she's in focus. Right. So the artist wants to show that she's and she's she's just slight off center, but the artist wants to show she's the center of this composition. You've got this woman who is very, um, very uh, who is she's not uh, she's not a tzius. Uh, she's not dressed in, a, in 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 Jewish standards of modesty. And she's pointing her finger to the men over here on the left hand corner. And so she's it, it seems that they're all trying to persuade her because they understand if you don't go at the king's bidding, it's off with your head, you're done for. Um, and in fact, the, the, the lack of clothing on this woman may actually indicate what some of the problem is. That um, Vashti understands that when she goes there, it's a lion's den of iniquity. Um, they are, they've been at this point, they have been drinking for 187 days. They're totally plastered. So I want to just create a framework. We're going to look at Vashti, but of course, Vashti in the context of this larger, remarkable story that is so familiar to us that sometimes we miss some central aspects of it. One of those aspects is the problem of governance. Not only is Akhtashverosh, does he make a, in his third year reign, make a party for 180 days and then a garden party for an additional seven days, after that, because he's deposed Vashti, his, uh, the Nare Hamelech, his servants, suggest that he, in order to, to distract him from feeling sad by what happened to Vashti and possibly blame them, 
his, he, 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 they, they make a pageant where women spend six months in myrrh and six months in oil. So if I'm not an accountant, but if you add this up, you're getting to almost two years where no one is minding the store. This book is a criticism of the Persian government. It's a criticism of the post of aspects of the in, of, of bureaucracy and inefficiency and excessiveness. And, um, and Vashti wants no part of that, right? Vashti wants no part of that. And here you see the artist has put her hands over her chest as opposed to the other, the, the woman in the back who seems to be more open chested, su suggesting she's not going in there, no how, no way. Here, this seems to be Achashverosh and you see a servant who's sort of watching what's going on. No one, of course, in the book of Esther is ever alone. That's the way it is in courtier homes. If you watch Downton Abbey or you're reading about Harry and Meghan, or maybe you're watching Bridgerton, it seems that there's all these people, wherever you are in a royal home, there's someone there to dress you and feed you and to share the schmutz about you with others. So the thing that I want to focus on, which is a detail, maybe, maybe just didn't catch, is what she's sitting on. She is sitting on a rug. I don't have a rug like this in my home. Um, it is, it, it seems to be a lion or a bear. I'm not quite sure, but there's something absolutely ferocious about this animal. And, and it's in a way, it's way, it's a suggestion the artist is making that this is actually going to consume her. So when we look at Esther in the biblical text, I'm just gonna ask if, if you're, uh, if you're not speaking, if you don't mind muting yourselves so that we have no ambient noise, that'd be terrific. Uh, so let's look at what happens in this text. Vashtia chadat en ones, kikain yisad hamelech al rav beto lasot kurzon ish viish. So there's uh, there's you know the the notion that every man. Or I'll, I'll I'll show you the translation in a second. Uh, here the rule for the drinking was no restrictions. For the king given orders to every palace steward to comply with each man's wishes, right? And we actually have a traditional uh, commentator say that act that it used to be that when people went to parties, it wasn't they they were told you have to drink. They were forced to drink, um, sort of like a, a frat hazing. And um, and he says, and when you drink, you know, you, you can drink and do whatever you want. And notice the ish, because it's going to be ish and not ish. She also made a party for the women, Beit Malchud, in the house of the king. But as opposed to, there's no restrictions in the male drinking party, there were plenty of restrictions here. On the seventh day, Ketov Lev HaMelech B'yayin, I will translate this formally as when the king was plastered, um, he says to a group of his uh, courtiers, I don't know why he couldn't have one courtier, but he seems to require a whole gang here, perhaps because he knows that this request is inappropriate. Lahavi, right here, at Vashti Amakalif Neamelch Beketer Machud, Laharot Amim Basarim et Yofia Kitovat Marehi. Basically, and, and that's why I said to, uh, to Samantha's point, the text says, she was beautiful, right? Ki tovat marehe, and says yofia. She was beautiful and good to look at, easy on the eyes. So not the way that she is commonly depicted. We have to talk about where that came from. So she's he, and we had a, another sort of rabbinic take on this, that when she was asked to come in her crown, that it was only her crown and nothing else. Now you don't have to go that far to that level of depravity to understand that there's something gravely wrong here. The king, um, if you recall, uh, Vashti was the true royal here and Achashverosh got into power through her coattails as being uh, her husband. And uh, it is he um, who, uh, who now in three years on the throne thinks a great deal of himself and his power. So. Sub, making her subservient by saying, you come in your crown and I'll show you that my crown is actually greater than your crown because I have the capacity to boss you about. She understandably says, no, no, how, no way. Vitima'ain is a word that we're familiar with. It's the word that Joseph uses, uh, that's used to discuss Joseph when he refuses to come at the beckoning of Asia Potiphar. 
there's something wrong with this. Um, as one scholar says, you know, she's uh, she's not a concubine. She's the queen. She's not a plaything for the king. And the king is extremely angry. Now we know what happens in the story um, that he takes all of his advisors and you know, he's, he, a, 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 and again, a criticism of too much government. Um, the king has a, a royal, pro, like a marriage problem. And all of a sudden it becomes a whole procedural issue with everybody. Um, just imagine that to be the case, right? That, uh, that you had a personal problem, but you were in a position of government. So your personal problem becomes everybody's issue. Uh, think about it when the king, when when the president of the United States uh, goes and has uh, his his or her physical, um, and and all of a sudden, you know, n nothing works, right? Uh, and the, the whole and the whole country gets uh, gets to know exactly what's happening. Um, and and then there's a rule that's put out to everybody, and the rule is, you know, that uh, the rule is that. Uh, no, that that all all men should establish themselves in their homes, right? They establish their power in their home. So let's look at let's look at what happens. Uh, to, what happens to Vashti in the Talmud? So the Talmud just ranks on her, right? And um, and let's look at a few Talmudic in, in translation. If you're with me. Vashti made a feast for the women, which belonged to Ahasuerus. We just looked at that. The Gemara says, why, why did she hold a feast in the royal house, a place of men, rather than a woman's house? That's where it should have been. And Rabbi said, oh, no, no, the two of them had sinful intentions. Ahasuerus wished to fornicate with the women, and Vashti wished to fornicate with the men. So bringing them together, you know, was a good thing. So here, Vashti is someone who has licentious intentions. Uh, she's very sexually active. This explains the folks saying that people say he with pumpkins and his wife with zucchinis. Now, I'm just not going to go there. I don't even know what that means. Um, but anyway, that's one reading of, of the Vashti story. Let's read some more. The Gemara says, is that to say that until now his heart was not married with wine? Where it says on the seventh day his heart was married with wine. Did it take seven days for him to achieve merriment? And Rabbi said, no, the seventh day was Shabbat. And on Shabbat, uh, when the Jewish people eat and drink, they begin by occupying themselves with words of Torah and praise of God. But the nations of the world, when they eat and drink, they begin only with words of licentiousness. Now, you have, something's really important to understand here is, and I hope I'm, I hope this isn't a mistake, but this is, uh, this is my very strong feeling, which is that there is more parshanut, more exegesis in the Talmud and the Esther story than in any other. And I believe, again, this is just my theory, I believe that it's because the rabbis in Bavel, in Babylon, understood Persian rulership. They, the, one of the ways that we overcome those who have power over us is that we make fun of them, right? We make fun of them because we can't equalize the relationship in any other way. And the rabbis had lots of thoughts about what it meant to live in a diaspora community and not have autonomy. So I think they had they made, they had all these fantasy readings of this book, which are really fascinating. And Vashti is one of them. And um, and here, uh, you know, uh, he, he talks about um, the wish to see Vashti and Vashti to be humiliated. Here's an important thing that no one had mentioned, but I thought was going to come up in in uh, in uh, fun facts about Vashti uh, that Vashti was punished in this humiliating way. For it, she she was punished in a midah connected midah way, a measure to measure. God punishes individuals in line with their transgressions. This teaches that the wicked Vashti would take the daughters of Israel, strip the naked, and make them work on Shabbat. We don't have that detail. We don't have that detail anywhere. Uh, and, but it, it was something the rabbis thought. Therefore, it was decreed that she'd be brought before the king naked and naked on Shabbat, right? On the seventh day. As it says, after these things, when the wrath of Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, what was decreed upon her. It, that is to say that as she had done with the young Jewish woman, so it was decreed upon her, right? Now, but Queen Vashti refused to come. Here you go with the ugly Vashti, Samantha. The Gemara says, since she was immodest, the two of them had sinful intentions. What's the reason she didn't come? Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina said, this teaches she broke out in leprosy and she was embarrassed to expose herself. An alternate reason for her embarrassment was taught in a bright that the angel Gabriel came and fashioned for her a tale. Now, in order to understand why Vashti gets such a hard time, 
Well, actually, you know what? Let me ask you. Why do you think Vashti gets such a hard time? Why did he give her such a hard time? I mean, honestly, she, what's she doing wrong? She refuses to come. Actually, you could say, you know, she was modest. She refused the king's evil intentions. It was a good thing that she refused. What do you think? Don't be shy. Rabbi. Um, there are a lot of, I, I, first of all, the, the, I mean, and we find it in other places in the Gemara. The Gemara says because she was the granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. So right away, we actually learned that in our share last night, in, in our Gemara share last night. And it's like, we can't have anything nice to say about her because of that. And also the fact that if you, if you look carefully in the Medrash, when it says that she fashioned a tail, it's Malach Gavriel, the angel Gabriel. Gabriel is always the Malach who has to ensure that God's plan plays out. It's mm -hmm. the same Malach that when Joseph is looking for his brothers mm -hmm. and he can't find them, he says that he finds Ish, for him, say, Yo, Ish, who's the Ish? It's Malach Gavriel. So this Gabriel has like, sort of, this is how we have to have Jewish destiny and Jewish providence has to take place. So we have to like find ways, like, you know, we shoot the, uh, we, we, we shoot the arrow and then we paint the bullseye afterwards kind of thing. Um, yeah. So that's the way I've always understood it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a beautiful reading. And our son is named Gabriel for just that reason. Uh, the rabbi and I did not plan this, uh, but the idea that Vashti was in some way implicated, if you recall, when we introduce Mordechai, we talk about him as the as, as, as exiled. And that pasuk, uh, the second pasuk, to, right after Mordechai's introduction, says four times that he, is, he has been exiled. And he's been exiled in the exile of Nebuchadnezzar. So Vashti is tied to that family ancestrally. And she's seen as carrying on the mission that was most antithetical to Jewish life and that put the Jews in the diaspora and in this very precarious position in the first place. So it's inter interesting to me that for all of the modern readings that try to, you know, sort of uh, affirm Vashti's decision, and we're, we're going to look at them together, they sort of sort of miss the mark. They don't understand that this, this book is really a criticism of the diaspora community, a criticism of the Persian government, a criticism of the sexually entrenched way in which the Persians behaved as a way of also salvaging the Jews and, and, and Jewish reputations. So what I wanna do, we're gonna go back to our shared screen because I know you really wanna know about Vashti's comfy pants. Um, and this is uh, right here, Rabbi. Wait, can is can I just ask you a quick question? Um, before you get off, the, why has nobody talked about this before? I'm just wondering, in all the time that we were in school when we were younger, don't you think we could have had a hint more about this information also? Yeah. Like, well, why do you I, think it's not brought up? Yeah, I mean, or, I, it's, it's a fantastic question. And I think actually that one of the problems with reading a text in a liturgical way, and I was reading it in a shul multiple times, is that we're so familiar with the text that we don't actually look at this, the sophisticated Torah to be learned here, um, the sophisticated mm -hmm. themes here. Um, and, you know, I mean, sometimes that's a fault of poor teaching. I also actually, I mean, this is, this is gonna take me off in another direction, so I'm, I'm gonna rein myself in, but um, a lot of little children are taught midrashim because they feel story-like, and they're not actually taught the pshat, the literal reading of the text, after which they can tell other stories. Um, and so my kids would come home sometimes with very weird readings that actually made the kids think that these stories couldn't possibly be true. Um, and, and no attention was given to the actual text of what really happened. So I think that, 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 that your question, you know, can really be understood on two levels, a conceptual and, a, and, a, and pragmatic, which is, you know, what did, what do people learn about these texts in order to teach them, right? So let's look at let's look at what Esther Rabbah says, um, just to confirm the rabbi's position. Why did this happen to Vashti, to her, to Vashti? Because she wouldn't allow Achishverosh to give permission to rebuild the temple, saying to him, "What well, my ancestors destroyed, you want to rebuild?" Again, if you unmuted, please mute yourself. Um, and um, and um, I, what I wanted to look at it just it, it is are, are some modern readings of this, which I think you might find interesting. <clears throat> um, Vashti's true flaw, according to Esther Rabba, was not her refusing her husband's inappropriate command, 
but her loyalty to her Babylonian roots. This makes Vashti the power behind Ahasuerus' refusal to build the temple and thus a villain deserving of divine punishment. Um, and, and that's why the rabbis painted her this way. The other thing which is important is that Esther is the heroine of this book and Vashti needs to be removed to make room for her. Seeing Vashti as a tragic figure interferes with the Jewish reader's enjoyment of Vashti's fall. The image of Vashti as a Jew shaming libertine justifies the replacement of Vashti by Esther and allows the reader to root for Esther and enjoy Vashti's downfall in a guilt-free reading experience, right? Fascinating way that was written. Well, anyway, there were plenty of people throughout history who felt terrible about Vashti. They did not have a guilt-free reading. And one of them was the poet Alfred Tennyson. I'm not going to read the whole poem, but poem is the princess. O Vashti, noble Vashti, summoned forth, she kept her state and left the drunken king to brawl in Shushan underneath his palms. Uh, that's not quite the story, uh, but I also wanted to point out that Vashti had a new life, was given new life by a number of early American suffragettes, namely Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucinda B. Chandler in their book, The Woman's Bible. And I uh, just want to read what you, they said about Vashti. We have some grand types of women presented for admiration in the Bible. Esther, who ruled as well as reigned, and Vashti, who scorned the apostles' command, wives, obey your husbands. She refused the king's orders to grace with their presence in the, in the reveling court. Um, and as it continues, this is Vashti had exercised heroic courage in asserting womanly dignity and the inherent human right never recognized by kingship to choose whether to please or to obey the king, right? So Vashti, what they saw in Vashti was exactly what they wanted as women advocating for their own rights. They wanted the right to choose, to make decisions about their own lives. So although they think Esther was wonderful and she saved her people, but they really thought that Vashti was the one a woman as queenly, as noble and self-sacrificing as was Esther, as self-representing and as brave as was Vashti, are hampered in their creative office by the unjust, unjust statues of men. And here you have maybe the greatest uh, praise of Vashti. She stands out as a sublime representative of self-centered womanhood rising to the heights of self-consciousness and of self-respect. She takes her soul into her own keeping. And, uh, and, and though her position as wife and queen are, are jeopardized, she's true to the divine aspirations of her nature. And it was, uh, Vashti here is praised because she says no. She says no. Another magnificent poem about Vashti. And this tells you what she might've been going through. Helen Hunt Jackson's poem, uh, just at the bottom, uh, you know, she says, before these drunken princes as a show, I am his queen, I will come of king's descent. I will not let him bring our crown so low. He will but bless me when he doth repent. It was when Vashti wakes up, he's going to realize, he's going to praise me. Thank goodness you didn't come to my debauched party uh, because it would have brought the office of the king and queen low. And so Vashti was doing this in this poem, not to help herself, but to actually help the office of Ahasuerus, the office of the king to help him. And, um, and here, Michelle Landsberg says, I thought, hey, what's wrong with Vashti? She had dignity, she had self-respect. She said, I'm not gonna dance for you and your pals. There I was nine or 10 years old. And I thought, I like Vashti, but I'm supposed to hate her. And in fact, that, that notion of, of having to hate Vashti seems to be a big part of the way that many Orthodox Jewish kids um, grow up. Now Vashti actually became, fun fact, Vashti actually became very important in, among black feminists and black activists. Um, as she be, it became a common name in the black community. The first Bishop of African Methodist Church is named Mash, Vashti Murphy McKenzie. What, a, what an amazing name. Uh, some of you recognize in Toni Tony Morrison's novel, Beloved, that Vashti is the name of Stamp Paid's wife. Um, and this, this I love, there is even an organization named Vashti, whose mission statement says in part, Vashti is a values-driven, faith-based communication and leadership initiative. It was conceived to strengthen the presence and voices of black women and girls as progressive facilitators, teachers, trainers, and advocates. And 
Vashti's comfort, Comfy Pants is, 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 is a children's book that just came out to help you, to help children demonstrate the use of their own voice and their own empowerment. So this is, wow, we've done 2000 years in, in, just, in, in just 25 minutes. And in thinking about this change in Vashti, people didn't pay attention to two things. Number one, they didn't pay attention to the fact that you can be a feminist and you can say no, or you can be a pragmatist and figure out how to manipulate the king. What's going to get you further? Right? And I think that, um, and it's interesting that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, because she took on the Bible's interpretation, she ended up minimizing her own influence in the movement, right? So that reasoning didn't really hold. So what we don't want to tell children is you're empowered, you have a voice, you can say no, uh-oh, and then you get deposed or banished or whatever else, it, uh, else happens if we're actually going to look at what happens in the story. So although Esther is not as pronounced, she actually figures out through her silence how to get, how to bend the king to her will. The other thing is the people forget the power of this diaspora narrative and what it means. And, you, you know, I, I think I said this uh, maybe last year when we were learning, uh, when we were learning from Purim together, that if you look at the, the if you look at the story, there are only three verses in the last chapter. And, you know, you can't help but look at the space in the Megillah. If you look, if you're using regular Megillah, or if you're using, you know, you're using a cloth or you're using a, you go, wait, wait a minute. Who chopped off the rest of that story? The fact is, I actually think that the authors of Esther intended you to read it that way so that you said, hmm, where did the rest of the story go? And what I mean by that is that when a story doesn't end, we sometimes create alternate endings or we continue that story. And if you continue any story of success in the diaspora, any story of success in the diaspora, it will always sour. That has been our experience in thousands, for thousands of years, no matter where it was that we lived, no matter how much influence we had. So rather than read this book as a story of success in exile, it's really designed to as a cautionary tale about what can happen when you live in exile, even exiles that are for a moment successful. Vashti was part of the reason for, um, Vashti was the, the, the first and earliest demonstration of what it means to be exiled, right? Before the Jews suffer their fate, she suffers hers. And that too is a criticism. Vashti, I believe, is a foil and a criticism for what it means to live under a power that's not your own, that makes decisions that you would never make, that acts impulsively in ways that you would never, that governs in ways that are irresponsible and says only when the Jews have their own autonomy in their own land will this be resolved. Now, if we're going to be accurate to this lesson, we'd all stand up and sing the Hatikva um, and wish Racheli Klibanov well in her aliyah, right? But the fact is, I think that it's hard to read this book. It's hard not to read this book this way. But unfortunately, a lot of diaspora Jews have read this as a story of affirmation of life in the diaspora. So something to think about before Purim, wishing you a frail Chapurim. I cannot wait to see your faces and have a L'chaim together with you. Um, and uh, a little ad de lo yada moment and, um, and have a great day. Thank great. you everyone for joining yeah, us. Thank you.